All right. Hello and welcome to Patton's Book Study Series, Structured Literacy Intervention, Teaching Students with Reading Difficulties Grades K-6. to My name is Dr. Pam Kastner, and I have the honor of serving as Patton State Lead for Literacy. And joining me this evening is our regional lead for our West office, Jeannie Hertzler. She's waving to you and our colleague at Patton West as well, Lauren Lutz. Okay. Uh, we have placed in the chat the link to this book study on the Patton Literacy Resource Hub. Here you will find the book study schedule, information about the book study, and a padlet where recordings and related resources for the book study will be found. Um, if you haven't been with us yet, I'm gonna quickly take you there just so you can see so you can get to everything. All right. And then everyone's seeing that Patent Literacy Resource Hub? Now, Jeannie, seeing that? I just wanna make sure, all right. So on the Patent Literacy Resource Hub, we're gonna go right here to where it says Patent Literacy Expert Series and Book Studies. All right, we're just going to scroll down a bit here. This is a series that we did celebrating the 20th anniversary of Hollis Scarborough's Reading Rope. Um, this is a book study that we did with uh, Elsa Cardenas Hagen and chapter authors, Literacy Foundations for English Learners. And then here we have the book study for structured literacy interventions. We're just gonna click right here. Whoops, nope, that's gonna take you to the schedule. <laughs> Hold on, I gotta move you guys around a little bit. There we go. Where is that now? I'm sorry, Jeannie, I don't, um, let's take me to the, oh, there it is, right on that hyperlink there. There we go, sorry about that, that hyperlink there. Um, this is Louise Bear Swirling, who is the editor of this wonderful book. Um, and you can go to the publisher as well. Here is the schedule. And then here is the Padlet. And this Padlet every week will have the chapter uh, recordings, the PowerPoint and the related resources shared here. Right here, you can see chapter three, you can see Dr. Kern's presentation. All you need to do is go up to this little square and it's gonna open up to the Padlet. And then you can go right to week three and there you are, all right? So I'm going to turn it over to Lauren Lutz who's going to introduce our, our chapter leader this evening, Dr. Devin Kearns. Hello everyone, really excited to be here tonight. Um, so I'd like to introduce our speaker, Devin Kearns is an associate professor of special education in the Department of Educational Psychology in the NEAG School of Education at the University of Connecticut and a research scientist for Haskins Laboratories and the Center for Behavioral Education and Research. Devin researches reading disability, including dyslexia, in elementary and middle school age children and designs instructional programs to assist students with reading difficulty. He publishes articles for educators and researchers on reading difficulty and works with schools and districts to support implementation of high quality reading instruction. Great. Uh, well, thank you for having me. Give me just a second to put the PowerPoint on the screen. Uh, okay, here we go. Okay. All right, uh, so I have the PowerPoint on the screen and I'm gonna put the chat down in the corner. Um, uh, Lauren, you can't see that, right? That's just for me. You can't see the chat box in my screen. No, I, we are good. Okay. We can see your Okay, good. Uh, but I can see the chat box. So if you have questions, uh, I'm more than happy to answer them uh, as we go. So. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for that great introduction. Um, Lauren already started off on a good note in terms of polysyllabic words because she said NEAG correctly, which is something that many people <laughs> fail to do um, because it looks like NEAG, but she knew it was a polysyllabic word, which is a great start for us this evening. So uh, here is just a a review of the topics that are covered in the chapter. Um, and I'm not gonna talk about them in exactly this order, but I'll cover all of these topics. I'm not exactly in the same way as they of course occur on the chapter. You didn't come here for me to just regurgitate everything that you already read. Um, but the goal will be for me to kind of elaborate on some of the things in the chapter um, and help you sort of get a sense for what I, in, you know, things that weren't entirely clear, you get a sense of what I intended. Um, and I am eager to answer questions. I know that um, some of the things we're gonna talk about in terms of syllables are things that not everybody agrees about, uh, and that is okay. And I am eager to answer your questions. So first we're gonna talk about syllables. 
So syllables, as you all know, are units in words that are defined by the presence of a single vowel sound. And at least when they're written, at least one vowel letter with just a few exceptions. Um, and so that will be important in a moment. And these are sometimes referred to um, as, um, sometimes referred to as larger parts or chunks in words, right? That's another way that people will sometimes describe these as, as chunks. Um, there are a couple of strategies that can be used that I've talked about in the book, and um, and I think, or in the chapter, that I think will be useful to you all. The first one is ishalav. Every syllable has at least one vowel, so every young letter in the word ishalav is here. And the idea is that a helpful thing is for students to be able to look at a word like fantastic. And what they can do is they can identify what the vowels are in the word and use that as an anchor to help them break the word into pieces. So fantastic is a pretty good example of a word, a three syllable word you can use to do this. So fantastic breaks nicely into three syllables like that, where you have the short A in each of these syllables. I'll say more about how to, how to divide these into pieces uh, in a bit. But what you see there is that we can begin by anchoring the the, the, the words around these vowel letters. And that's in fact, there are lots of data indicating that's actually how people understand words is went by finding vowels in them. And researchers have actually shown that when you have a word where you have two vowels next to each other, like in lion, vowel letters next to each other, like in lion or chaos, it actually is harder for people to uh, detect the presence of syllables because they're right next to each other and that makes it much more difficult for them. So what's really important is to know that people actually use vowels uh, cognitively as anchors when they're trying to figure out what a word is. So that's kind of the simplest thing to do is to teach students this Ishalav uh, principle. Um, another way to do this is to kind of use what we've termed the look okay strategy, which is a little bit of a tricky um, piece, especially for kids with pretty serious reading difficulty, but I'm going to tell you why we think it's effective. We've been testing this in an intervention that uh, my colleagues and I designed and we're currently testing, so I can't tell you with entire certainty that this um, particular strategy is effective, uh, but uh, we found we have been testing it and so far the preliminary data really look positive in terms of showing that the strategy works. So let me describe it to you. So if we take a word like describe, the idea here is that we need to break the word into parts so that every syllable has a vowel letter in it. And you see here that describe is a tricky one because there are three vowel letters but only um, two vowel sounds, to only two syllables in the word. So what we do is we break it into parts so that each of the parts sort of will say it looks okay. What I mean by look okay is that we have a unit in the word that's a legal unit. So one thing, legal unit meaning, it's a part of a word that can, uh, that we actually would see in English. So in the word describe, if we break it up into three parts this way, we have SCR as sort of a syllable in the word. The problem with SCR is that SCR never appears at the end of a syllable or the end of a word. And so we wouldn't be able to use that as a part in the word. It doesn't look okay. It doesn't follow ishala, but also doesn't look okay. We can divide the word up in different ways. Um, and so, um, and we can do it where a different part of the word can be, it can be broken into different parts of the word. So here we have the word describe again with the SCR at the end of the syllable. And that doesn't work for the reason we said SCR would never occur at the end of a syllable. The second thing then is, so if we look at that one, that one doesn't look okay. That doesn't work. Well, now let's do it a slightly different way. If we break it up this way, now we have DESC uh, as a syllable in the word. Now, D-E-S-C is tricky because it's possible for a syllable to end with S-C, like the word disc, um, something that uh, children don't know about anymore. Um, but uh, S-C does not occur that often at the end of a word. Um, more common would be for a, a syllable to end with an S. So we have the D-E-S, that part looks okay. And the C-R-I-B-E 
also looks okay because C and R can start a syllable uh, put together like that. So that so each of those parts uh, looks okay. Um, that presents sort of a challenge in terms of um, how we decode the word because people will sort of disagree about the best way to decode this word. But, and so the last option then is to put the DE together and then S-E-R-I-B-E. And that actually does look okay because S-E-R does occur at the beginning of a word, like in the word screen. So it can begin a syllable and it can begin a word. And as a result, it sort of looks, oh, it doesn't sort of, it does look okay. Whether or not we should actually use this pattern as opposed to something else is a question that we're going to get to in a little bit. The problem, as we've already, as I've already sort of alluded to, is that we have a challenge in English with these single letter vowels. Polysyllabic words have a lot of them. I'll just, as an aside, tell you why I chose to use the word polysyllabic rather than multisyllabic. The reason was that when I started doing research on this, there was a lot of dis <laughs> uh, there are different ways that researchers had done this. It turned out to be about 50-50 that researchers um, were uh, calling it polysyllabic versus uh, poly uh, multisyllabic. I landed on polysyllabic for two reasons. First is that syllable is a Greek word because it has that sort of Y as an indicator that it's Greek. Uh, and multi is usually a syllabic structure used with uh, words of Latin origin, where poly is used with words of Greek origin. So poly meaning um, many or multiple, like in polygon. And so that's why I chose to use it for one reason. The other one is that we talk about polymorphemic words, words with more than one morpheme, so it just seemed to line up. So. Uh, that's why I chose to say polysyllabic. It means <laughs> nothing in terms of instruction. So I don't say that to you as sort of like a recommendation for instruction. I just mention it um, because uh, you know, that's why I did that. So some people wonder, why did you change this from you know what we all know? That's the reason for it. So you all know that we have lots of challenges with these polysyllabic words that often have single letter vowels. What I mean by a single letter vowel is when you have a letter like I that occurs by itself and the meaning that it's surrounded by consonants or it begins a word and is followed by a consonant or ends the word and is preceded by a consonant. And so we really have a difficult time with these even though they occur so frequently in polysyllabic words. So you can see here we have the difference in terms of the I and the I sound in the word minor. We have the I saying the I sound. I wrote this in the International Phonetic Alphabet. So if that looks funny to you, that AI construction is actually the I sound. So that's I that says I. Then we have the I that says I, like in linen. So those are two different ways we can spell the uh, letter I. We then have a third way that's actually relatively common for the letter I, which is the E sound. In the International Phonetic Alphabet, the, I, the letter I represents E. And I tend to use uh, the International Phonetic Alphabet to kind of set as a standard that that's really um, the way that as educators, I think we wanna learn to indicate things because it's the standard that people use across the world. So, um, so that, I, that letter I represents the sound E and conveniently in the word glorious, we have I saying the E sound which again adds a little bit more complexity to the challenge that's presented to children and to us as teachers about how to teach it. We also have a reduced vowel like in rabbit. This is um, sometimes called, this is called a bar I. Some people call it a schwi sound because it sort of sounds a little bit like an is sound and a lot like a shortened sound, a reduced vowel meaning a schwa type sound. And then we actually do have the schwa sound, like in the word flexible, we have that actual schwa sound there um, represented by the upside down E. And what that means is that we have a very short syllable. The I saying is really quickly pronounced. And that's because in English we have, it's a syllable timed language. It's not necessary information, but I share it with you just because you are all on this uh, webinar because you're interested in the details of this. Um, in English, it's stress time, which means we try to preserve the amount of um, pronunciation time between stress syllables. So in flexible, flex is a st stress syllable and bull has a secondary stress to it. 
So we try to say that in between part really quickly, so it doesn't make the distance, it doesn't sort of expand the distance between the flex and the bull parts of the word. So it's sort of a technical thing, but that's why the schwa sounds exist. So that's another challenge is it's sort of like rabbit, but a little bit even less so flexible. You can hear it's almost, almost absent. And then sometimes it doesn't even say anything. Like in Raisin, you know, people would argue that really doesn't say a sound. You could argue to, it's sort of a little bit of a, it's not a joke exactly, but it's sort of a little, going a little bit far. You could argue that the I doesn't say anything or that it's like sort of a schwa sound. Um, but the point I'm making here is that we face a problem with deciding how to pronounce these single letter vowels. To further dramatize the point, take a look at these words. So what you'll notice here is that um, we have these different pronunciations that are based on patterns, these um, open syllable and closed syllable, pa syllable patterns I'll describe to you in a little bit. Um, and so we talk about the syllable being, we talk about a word having a, a long sound in the first syllable um, where this A says the A sound because it's followed by a consonant and another vowel. I'll explain more in a little bit. You see here that the A says A, razor, and meter, and vital, and motor, and tulip. So those are all ones that follow the pattern where you have the A, uh, the long vowel sound here um, when it's followed by a constant another vowel. But here are other ones where the same letter says a different sound. So wagon, sedan, vivid, novel, buses, or unusual. All of these different patterns have cases where it doesn't actually follow the expected pattern. So we don't actually know. So we don't actually, so it's actually a little bit hard to tell like which one is it supposed to be because these are all have that same pattern but they don't all seem to follow the same rule. And then we have a further challenge in the language where we have words like tariff and Mary. Um, and if you're from the Northeast like I am, you, you pronounce that A with an A sound and the, um, <laughs> the A and Mary with an, uh, an A sound, but many of you probably pronounce the A and the R together as R. Um, but many of those of the Northeast actually distinguish between tariff and Mary, but some people just don't. But I point out to you, I said, well, because you know it's not entirely clear, but it sort of indicates that um, there are other pronunciations of the letter A. Same thing with heron and hero. We have that you would say, well, that's an R-controlled vowel, but actually heron has a short E sound. We're kind of tricky there too. And same though spirit and virus, we have the short vowel and long vowel um, with the R after, which is sort of unusual too. The same thing with very uh, and busy and the busy, the U and busy doesn't even say the same thing. Uh, there's also a trick with U where the letter U can say the U sound and the U sound. So tulip is the example we put here, but it also applies to music, which has a U sound. So U is usually represented either by an O, uh, an U sound, like an OO, or a U sound, kind of like Y. You could pronounce it as Y-O-O, would be the way to think about that pronunciation of the U. All this to say, this stuff is really challenging. It's challenging for you as a teacher and certainly challenging for children. So what are we gonna do about it? The first thing we can do is to teach students about open and closed syllables. So open syllables are cases where the vowel comes at the end of a syllable and the vowel says the long sound, which most of you or all of you will know that the, uh, the, the long sound is the sound that the letter makes. So the A saying the A sound, like in this first column here, all of these say um, raise or meter and so on. They all say their long sound uh, where they say the actual name of the letter. Um, and that is an example would be B. So the letter E is at the end of the syllable. That's where I put the dot there. And we would say that at the end of the syllable, the letter E says the E sound, that's an open syllable. The closed syllable is when the vowel comes at the beginning or in the middle of the syllable and the vowel says it's short sound and you all probably know the different short sound, ah, uh, ah, uh, eh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And, um, and so basically because the E is in the middle of the syllable, it says it's short sound. So the first thing we can do is to teach students about the pronunciations of these parts of words. I'm going to say for you that if you want to call them open and closed, I don't really have an objection to this. At the same time, I will tell you that I've sort of landed more recently 
in some of the programs we've been designing on not calling them open and closed syllables. I instead am calling them long vowel syllables and short vowel syllables because I think that as said at the bottom of the slide, this is kind of meta knowledge. I think this is really valuable for teachers to understand is that there is a term to describe these patterns. And I know for me, when I first learned about the science of reading, when I first, when I didn't say this before, but when I started teaching reading, I actually did a really bad job of it. I had a lot of kids who didn't succeed because I didn't understand the science. And after a couple of years of that, I actually got training on how to teach about the science of reading and I did much better. And one of the things I learned about was open and closed syllables and syllable division, which I'll explain in a little bit. Uh, and that's kind of tricky as I point out in the chapter. But the thing here is that I started to move away from the term open and closed syllables for children because I don't really know that they need to have a sense of that knowledge. They really need to know something different, which is uh, which I'll describe to you in a minute on the right side of the slide. But I think that for me as a teacher, I was like sort of excited about that. I was excited about open and closed syllables, and they were the, there were these terms for these things. I was excited about syllable division because I was like, oh my gosh, finally, these long words can make sense to students in ways that they just didn't in the past. And so I was really excited about it. But when I went to teach it to kids, it turned out to be a lot of work for them and a lot of thinking and a lot of extra language that didn't seem necessary to me. And so for a long time, I did teach students the terms open and close, but I've sort of moved away from it because um, it's, it's knowledge that children don't actually need. And I know a lot of you have probably done training where you've learned about open and closed syllables and talked about teaching them to kids. This is where I think a lot of the training that you all have been receiving in the science of reading uh, is really valuable because it's teaching you a lot of things about reading that uh, were probably not obvious to you. But you wanna think about which of those are necessary for children to learn versus necessary for you and important for you to learn as an educator, and not necessarily things that children need to know. And I think that's become a real priority for me as a researcher um, and an educator, a teacher educator, is to really emphasize um, that we don't need to have necessarily a term like that, like open and close. Rather, we can refer to them as something like a long vowel syllable or a short vowel syllable. Um, so, um, and so I'll come back to the, the question in the chat. Um, but uh, so, so here on the right side is an example of what we've done in some of our recent work. This is from the program I was design I was describing to you. And we talk in here that this is a little routine that we had the students do. We basically every day had them practice um, how to say these things. So we'd say the short, the teacher would say the short vowel for A is at, what is the short vowel sound? And the students would repeat it. And we do the same thing with the long vowel sound. So this is the teacher language that we used um, to teach students about this. Um, and you can see there, we didn't, um, we didn't talk a lot about um, the names of these syllables, we just talked about the fact that they could have the long sound and the short sound. So that is a transition I've made in my own work. But you see, I just talked to you, we did a whole slide here on open and closed syllables. Why? Because I think it's important knowledge for you to have about the way words are designed. There's a question in the chat. If you're not teaching open syllables as long vowel syllables, what terminology do you use for vowel teams that make the long sound? Good question. So, um, so that's a good question. I talk about those as vowel teams, right? And so, and I actually talk about vowel teams as any um, multiple letter unit. And I don't distinguish actually between um, like long vowel and short vowel uh, vowel teams because there are a variety of them. In fact, I even include things that sometimes people will separate um, sometimes people talk about digraph syllables, and then they'll talk about um, they'll talk about uh, diphthong syllables because there are certain patterns like ow and um, oi that where the vowel is kind of a two-part vowel, and so people sort of separate those into diphthong syllables. But I think again, like that's really again kind of meta knowledge children don't need. Uh, it's enough for them to learn that you know, when you see the OI, it says OI. 
what I'll add see, for those of you who are sort of like, well, really, what I'll say is that actually all the long vowels actually have that kind of character. So like if you think about you, you is actually a diphthong too, but we don't teach um, the, the, you know, you or the, um, or like the A even can be considered a diphthong. So I really talk about them as long vowel syllables and short vowel syllables. And then for vowel teams, it's basically they can make the sound um, and they can make the sound, the long or the short sound. We're going to talk about them as vowel teams. But I take your point that we call them long vowel and short vowel syllables, but there are other ones that make the long and the short sound. Um, something I actually didn't think of when we put that together. We found that kids respond to that pretty well, but I'll be honest, like I actually think that's a really good point and maybe something to think a little bit more about. But I think um, I think the vowel team is sort of the idea like that you have all of these different patterns. And I that was why I included in that like the IGH is a vowel team because if you use the term vowel team, you don't actually have to have it be two letters rather than saying a digraph and so on. Um, so, so what is that typo on the blue script? What is a short vowel sound versus a long vowel sound for? Um, so, so this is basically the same routine here with the different letters. So the short sound for A, so we basically um, say the short sound for A is A, ah, what's the short vowel sound? And we say the long sound for A is A. What is the long sound for, um, it should say, what is the long sound for A or something like that? But so I guess that's a typo, but really basically what we're saying is we're taking the same letters and we're telling, asking the students to tell us the short and the long vowel sounds for each of the letters because they can make either of those sounds. So that's so that's what that is. It's, I guess it's a, it should say, what is the long vowel sound? Um, it should be a long vowel sound, right? Um, rather than saying long sound for that. That's something that I didn't, <laughs> didn't catch that typo uh, when we wrote that lesson. So thanks for that. You know, I think that's, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Karen. I appreciate the clarification. Um, your quick study there. Um, so, um, Mary asked, do you ever say that the long vowel sound says the vowel's name? Yeah, I think so. I, um, good question. Do we do that? I think that we do talk about, I think we do talk about that. I can't remember exactly. I don't have, um, I think it's a good thing to do. I think especially for, you know, kindergartners, I think it's a helpful thing for them to learn about is that the vowel letters can say their names. Obviously, like with kindergartners, when you are teaching them the, um, the, the like teaching the first syllables you want to, the first vowel sounds you want to teach kindergartners are the short vowel sounds. Those are really the most common ones, the ones you want to teach. But, um, but the letter A saying sort of the A says its name is important for kids to know to begin with, right? So that they can understand the alphabet that the A, E, I, O, the A, E, I, O, U, those are letters that, they, those are the names of the letters. The students need to understand that those are the names of the letters and that for older students, when we're teaching them about the single letter vowels saying a sound, yeah, I think you can teach students that they say the long vowel sounds, yep. Uh, Elise asked, do you use a system such as the Fano visual chart for vowels um, to provide keywords for visual cue that contain target phoneme you're trying to teach your students? Um, I don't know the Fano visual chart. I'd be curious to know more about it. Um, I'll say that, you know, I, what I would ask about that is um, the question I always ask is that meta knowledge. So that's the thing to consider is, are we giving students a lot of extra information? Sometimes having a really simple visual cue is a good thing. So I don't have any objection to that. When I teach people about um, reading monosyllabic words, I talk a lot about having like a picture anchor for um, reading a word. So um, for reading, a, for learning the spellings of a sound. So for example, if you're teaching the A sound, you might have a picture of a whale that um, represents the A sound. Um, so when you're teaching students the different spellings of the A sound, they have this kind of visual anchor for that. So depending on what that is, I think it could be fine, but I have to know more about it. Actually, I'll look it up when we're finished here. Sorry, Lisa, I don't know it. Um, and so along with that, um, I see here another good question. Um, uh, Pam asks, um, do you have a preferred, let's see, what is that? Do you have a preferred, keep, there are a lot of questions coming in now, so let me see if I can get this one. Um, so, so Hannah asked, do you have a preferred set of visual posters you suggest when teaching syllable types division? I don't. Um, 
One thing I don't recommend is the syllable house. So, um, so the syllable house is something people have done to sort of indicate that the vowels can say they're open and close sounds. And sort of the idea is that when you have um, the syllable house, when the door is closed, the vowel says it's short sound. And then when you open this door, then it says it's long sound. This is again, another kind of like meta knowledge made kid friendly. So it's sort of like, why do we need to know about a house? Like I get the idea, but it sort of adds complexity to it. And a number of programs that I really like, um, uh, I won't name, I try not to name the names of programs, but some of the programs I find to be uh, really beneficial for students and have evidence to support them, they don't typically do kind of syllable house stuff. And I think a lot of uh, educators have kind of come up with that as a strategy to teach kids this language because it's not intuitive to them. And I don't think that that was, you know, sort of a bad idea. It sort of goes along with the um, sort of this, you know, people learning these important things about the language and then wanting to apply them in the classroom. So I totally understand that. Um, Christine asked, can we go back to calling the multi-letter phonograms? Um, maybe, I, you know, I actually like, sometimes I'll call them rhymes um, or rhyming syllables um, rather than multi-letter phonograms. I actually don't mind the term phonogram, um, but again, this is a, I'm always questioning the question is like, is that meta knowledge? Do kids need to know what a phonogram is or can we just tell them it's like a, you know, a rhyming syllable. So I assume by phonogram, you mean like a body rhyme unit, like, you know, ING says ing or whatever. And if that's what you mean, I would say that um, it's not a problem to teach uh, students maybe the word phonograms, but similarly, I always think about that is that meta knowledge the kids don't need. And can we just call them rhyming syllables, which is typically what I've done is to call them rhyming syllables. Um, so, and then Pam also asked, do you teach two long vowel sounds for you? We do teach the kids two long vowel sounds for you because the U does say U and does say U. So that one we actually do teach. We actually teach the Y also, that Y has multiple sounds. And that's not on that page, but we do that as well. Um, so uh, Megan asked, do you think sound walls feature too much meta knowledge? That's a critic I hear of them. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Megan, I didn't see the second part that I said you weren't supposed to say your name. Apologize for that. Sorry, I didn't catch it. Um, so, uh, but it could be any Megan in the world. We don't even know who it is. Just don't scroll back to chat. Um, and so, uh, but I think, you know, that's a criticism. I don't, I, it depends what people mean by sound walls, right? So there are different ways of doing sound walls. And so, um, and so it depends on kind of what that means. So I don't think you should worry about your name because there are a lot of different things that um, a sound wall could be. So it really depends on how people do it. But if people are putting a lot of information about open and close and so on, the question I always ask is, um, is that extra stuff that kids may not need to know? Um, Stephanie asks, what about words that the vowel does not make the long sound but it's not a closed syllable like do? Yeah, that's another kind of tricky case. So, um, so, so we have to often teach kids that vowels say other sounds as well. That's part of what we do as we build their reading skill. Sometimes I describe this as sort of like a treasure hunt that um, when we, we, we sort of send kids on a treasure hunt when we teach them to read um, words. And basically the idea is that when we teach them about the letter sound system, we start with the stuff that works pretty well. And slowly as they advance in the treasure hunt, we sort of reveal the other complexities of the words. So we would reveal, for example, that the EA says E, and then eventually we sort of tell them about the part that EA says eh, and the same thing with the C, C says k, and then we teach them that C says s, and then we teach them that CK says k also, and so we sort of reveal this over time. Um, and so it's sort of like a treasure hunt where we sort of learn the next thing after we sort of gotten comfortable with the previous thing. And so I sort of like that way of thinking about it. Um, do, I would say, is something that is a high frequency word that I would probably teach as a unit. So uh, because basically by doing that, I don't have to sort of include it in the pattern. You can, students may bring it up um, and you might just tell them that's a high frequency word and we're just gonna remember that one. Um, a lot of people have been talking now about the fact that you don't want to um, sort of say like something, first of all, you don't wanna say that it's like broken or it doesn't follow the rules, so to speak, because I think we wanna, sort of emphasize the degree which the language um, works rather than doesn't work. 
Um, and so but we might, and, and as a result, we would actually want to teach the students that the D says what we expect it to do, and the O might not say what we expect it to say. Remembering too that what is decodable depends on what kids have learned so far, but O really isn't something where the O says, who um, isn't frequent enough that we would um, teach that probably as a pattern. But if it comes up, we might say that, yep, in this case, the O doesn't say the O sound or the A uh sound, um, but that is just for the word do, or that's just for a few words like do. Um, and that way students will know that. Um, Eileen asks, is your, in your study with the local case strategy, how has that worked for English uh, multilingual learners? Actually, that's a good question. We have not tested it with uh, multilingual learners because in this study, it was a, it's a study where we're scanning kids' brains as we are doing instruction every four days in an intensive summer program. So we actually excluded those students because um, they develop uh, letter sound knowledge in a different way. And, or sorry, not letters on knowledge, but they develop understandings of the sound structure in a different way. So I actually suspect, Eileen, that that's something that would not be as good a strategy for them because um, those students might not be familiar with what looks okay. Um, and so that is one challenge for a pattern like that. A lot of these things will be tricky for students because when you don't know the language very well, trying to figure out what the word is can be really tricky. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, so, um, uh, so Christine, I can't remember, Christine, what you had asked before. Christine, oh, multi-letter phonogram, she said. Um, oh, I see. She said me, O, W, O, U. Yeah, I think, so I do think it's, a, so teaching O, W and O, U. So what she wrote about is like, she says, I mean things like O, W, O, U, A, I, A, Y, and so on. Like, can we teach these as kind of pairs or partners? The question is, uh, the answer is, in my mind is yes, we should be anchoring um, their understandings by sound so that OW and OU are linked together by sound. And that's something that Louisa and Motes has sort of advocated. I don't know about letters training now and other things like that, but, um, but I know that OW and OU, um, once upon a time, she had said that those are really important to link together that way because they're anchored by the sound. We teach students the different um, spellings of the sound. So yeah, so absolutely, if that's what we're talking about, then I 100% we want to teach kids about those. Um, the word phonogram, um, some people have used historically, and I've used it this way too, is to uh, refer to a body rhyme unit, so like ing or INK or OLD, for example. Um, and so that's what I meant by, by phonogram. Sometimes people use that term, but, um, but obviously, as you were pointing out, not everybody, everybody does. Okay, um, Pam is suggesting to me we, ask, we answer questions at the end. So I'm going, to, I'm going to come back to the presentation so we can finish all the things we intended to. But I, um, and I realize now we're actually running out of time. So Pam, thanks for getting me back on track. Um, so, uh, so the next thing is to practice syllable pronunciation. So regardless of what you call it, um, we want to have students practice reading high frequency syllables. And we can have them read them with the pattern, knowing that if we teach them that the long vowel sound is a sound at the end and the short vowel sound is a sound in the middle, when you see L-I, you can say lie. When you see L-I-N, you can say lin, and R-E says re, and so on. You can even teach them that M-A says may, even though at the end of a word, the A doesn't say the A sound, but you can teach them that when it's in the middle of the word, the um, A can say its name. So that's really important to think about is that uh, even though I said like I don't teach those terms, I definitely suggest teaching kids that the um, vowels can say the long sound and the short sound and basically having them practice reading them. And that's actually uh, John Scheffelbein, actually a long time ago, um, did a really cool study where he actually found that teaching kids these units um, had positive effects on their word reading skill. So he didn't do, he didn't call them open and closed syllables. Um, he just focused on these pronunciations and uh, found that students were improved their reading by practicing reading um, syllables in this way. And so I think that there are good data to support that as a strategy. So along with that then is when you're gonna put words together, you can basically use this to teach kids to read words flexibly. So if we know that the, um, we have to have the Ishala principle, every syllable has at least one vowel, and we know that vowels can say the long sound or the short sound, then we can break this word into pieces. So we can use sort of like a syllable card, sometimes we call it. You don't have to make it any, you don't have to make 
card, but Pete, you can have kids do it with their finger, but I sometimes like a little card. It makes it a little bit easier to see. Sometimes their finger gets in the way of the whole word when they do it. Um, so you take a word like linen and we can break it into this part where the L-I says lie, and then we say lie and then, and we try to put together and that says linen, and that's not a word that we know, a student would know, and so they end up not knowing what the word is. It's like, that doesn't make sense. And so then when it doesn't make sense, we switch it and we try it the other way. So again, now we have the vowel or we have the vowel in the middle of the syllable, not at the end. Um, and now we know because we practiced it that the I N at the, the I and the N at the end that, of that part says in, that this part says lin. And so then we can put it together and we can read linen. So that is, um, so that's how we do that with the high frequency syllables. The big question that some of you may be thinking about is about syllable division. Um, and I basically would be recommending not, in general, not really using syllable division as a strategy. And I'll explain why. I am gonna explain what it is because it's a very common and popular thing to do. The idea of it, thinking about that meta knowledge is really, um, uh, the meta knowledge is really useful because for you as a teacher to understand how the language works. Um, Lisa said something about um, EL students and flexing the vowel, and I agree with you, Lisa. I'm going to come back to that point about the challenge with EL students um, for them with this. Um, for syllable division, just so you're, if you're unfamiliar with the idea of syllable division, the idea in syllable division, you take a word like pillow, and we can you basically have it where you have that first syllable is the short vowel sound. And then we have this pattern that students learn. And that pattern is that when you have a two consonants in the middle. You break it in between those two consonants, which then makes that first syllable a closed syllable, and therefore we say um, pill as opposed to pie, right? And so that one would be an example of where we had that happening, and so rabbit would be an example of how we would do that. So let's say rab. And pilot is the other pattern, and this is the tricky one. So we have that open syllable pie. It says the long sound, so that's pie. And the pattern is that we have the vowel constant vowel pattern. And so we have the, after the vowel, we have that, uh, we divide after the vowel and the, uh, that first syllable says the long sound. And so that part of the word um, says the long sound. And so then tiger, we can divide up in this way. And so we have the pattern and we break it up into these parts. And then we can say the word is tiger. That does happen sometimes in English. And I think as a teacher, I found it really exciting and interesting to know that information. But the data suggests, and this is from a study that I did in which we mentioned in the, in the chapter, that these don't always work. Now, it is true that the, um, the short vowel sounds do work. Uh, well, the vowel constant, constant vowel pattern, we divide between the constants, does work. And what you see here in the black part is the percentage of the time where the, um, the, the, the A or the single letter vowel followed by two consonants says the short sound is really frequent. And this even includes the schwa sound. So you have here in the, the sort of gray, sort of a middle gray color, that's the schwa sound. And you can see even with the counting for the schwa sound, there are lots and lots of cases where the vowel says um, the short sound. So if you want to teach kids about the vowel constant constant vowel strategy, it actually turned out not to be a super bad idea to do that. Um, and when you're thinking about teaching students about how to break words into parts, it might be okay to mention that. I don't tend to because I feel like we can um, teach kids to break the word into parts. We might mention they could divide between the syllables. We don't have to teach them the rule. And we don't have to teach them, for example, um, one of the things that gets taught sometimes is about kind of this division part where you have this formal vowel constant constant vowel part. And you, it says it's a short sound. You mark that sometimes with a, a short sound, the breath, which sort of indicates the short sound. That's that kind of smiley face thing above the vowel. Um, and so I think that's not necessary for sure. Um, so then, uh, so basically that vowel constant constant vowel pattern, totally workable. Problem comes with the other one, which is the vowel constant, uh, vowel constant vowel pattern, right? So in these cases, what you have here is the, I'm sorry, this is not correct. The black is not the long sound. It's the middle, it's sort of darker gray, not the black one. So darker gray represents the long vowel sound. So here you can see that, for example, in the short, the lighter gray, the sort of middle light gray, I should have used different colors for these, but 
Um, the vowel that's the reduced vowel, the short, the, the uh, schwa sound, the uh sound, like in um, uh, sort of flexible, the I saying the sort of schwa sound, that's these ones here. And what you can see is that um, with the letter A, the A says the A sound a lot more than it says the A sound. So for that one with two syllable words, five syllabic words, um, that does work pretty well. With the letter E, a lot of instances of letter E say the reduced vowel sound. And so that part is actually pretty tricky. Um, and we don't see that quite as often as we would um, as we do the long and short vowels. The tricky part here is that if you look at the instances where the E says eh or the E says E, the E actually says eh more often, which is the black one, than it says E. So actually with the E, the opposite pattern works better. Um, that's not as true for the other one. So the, with the I, it's still the case, the long vowel syllable works more, with the O it still works more, and with the U it works pretty consistently. But you can see here is that the pattern is not entirely consistent. And the big issue is that I didn't put these on the screen, but that with words with more than two syllables, it becomes really rough. And so the problem is that we find that um, it might not be a good idea to teach it because we have such inconsistency. What people sometimes mention to me is like, yeah, well, you could teach students the vowel consonant and break it after the consonant vowel strategy as a backup strategy. I agree, but that's where it comes back to the syllable card that I described before. Couldn't we just teach the students that it's a long vowel and the, when we had the vowel in the middle, uh, we have the vowel not at the end of the syllable, it says a short sound, and if we have it at the end of the syllable, it says a long sound, and then we can basically break the word into parts in that way. We don't have to teach students a, a rule for that at all. They can just do this breaking up thing that I'm describing. The good thing about the sort of the breaking up thing, this dividing without a rule part, maybe using that syllable card and the knowledge that the vowel can say the long and short sound, what's really helpful about that is that it's a really quick way to do it when you're reading. And the syllable division part um, in this kind of formal way turned out to be a lot trickier when students are trying to read um, on the fly, right? So when you're reading in an actual word, when you're reading in text, it can be trickier for students to, to do that. So that's why I've sort of landed on not teaching the rules. And it's also kind of a, it's a lot of sort of, again, meta, sort of meta knowledge. I think it's important for teachers to know. That's probably why I put it on the slides, but I think it's not important for students to know. I'm gonna skip this video. <laughs> basically, this video is of me from a long time ago. Um, basically, what you see me in doing this, uh, this lesson is teaching kids about syllables, but not in a very constructive way. So I'm gonna skip that for now um, because of our time. But, um, but what I wanna to come to, and this gets to the question about multilingual learners, um, we wanna teach kids reasonably familiar units, which is to say, we wanna teach them things that they might've seen before. Here is a word that occurred in th that was used in a program that I once taught, um, that is one that's widely used, again, I'm not gonna use names, um, and the word was Pipkin. It was included on the list of real words. Well, it turns out that Pipkin is a real word, and you know what it is. If you know what it is, <laughs> then there you go. That's what it is you didn't know. It's this earthenware pot that was used, I don't know, like in the, you know, in the Middle Ages. I think it's actually earlier than that. I think it was used by like Sumerians or something. Um, and it's a, clay pot called a pipkin. But no kid knows that that's a thing, right? So for a kid, um, and for many of you too, that's just a nonsense word, right? Treating it as a real word isn't really, you know, it's just a real word because somebody gave it that definition. That's not really a real word, right? Um, another example is that there was a, in this program as well, there was an example of teaching students to polish off the gumdrops. And I actually saw a lesson by a really accomplished teacher where the teacher was trying to, um, to teach the students about this. And they're actually multilingual learners. And they thought the polish out the ground dress meant that you actually like took all the sugar off of them, right? <laughs> because they didn't understand the phrase polish out the ground drops. Now that's a pretty rare phrase that I don't know how many of us, you know, use the words polish off to describe eating something, um, finishing eating something, you know, but maybe we do, but it's not very common. And then for multilingual learners, it's a pretty, um, uh, Miriam says, 18th century for the Pipkin. Okay, so, so no worries, Miriam. Thank you very much for remembering this. I've showed this in a book before or in a, another article, so I should have remembered. But anyway, thank you. Um, but the issue here, again, is that these are really rare phrases. So we want to use words that students have likely heard. 
This becomes a challenge for multilingual learners because they might not have heard a lot of the words. For them, a lot of the words we might be teaching them are sort of nonsense words in a way, right? They've never really encountered those words before. So it certainly means teaching Pipkin is a really bad idea. It also though means we're teaching kids to decode. A lot of the words we teach them are going to seem like nonsense words. And that's a problem when we're teaching them something like the uh, division strategies I'm talking about. So like linen is actually a pretty good example of a word that might not work for a multilingual learner because linen is not that common a word. And so if we want to use a word like linen to teach students a pattern, then you know it's challenging if they don't know what the words are. So the solution in my view isn't to teach them the rule because you know because the rule does work sometimes. Rather, it's to teach students a lot about uh, language units. So, um, so that is one thing. And so what I recommend is you can use uncommon words, but not really rare words. Um, and if you're using less common words, introduce them before the lesson. Um, an example of this is, uh, let's talk about it in a second. Um, you can use nonsense words sometimes for kids who guess a lot, um, but I would not recommend them for English learners. I would not recommend them for multilingual learners because these students, again, are learning a lot of these things um, as um, uh, they're, they're learning them as, uh, they're unfamiliar words anyway. So what I do recommend is pre-teaching pronunciations of these. I mean, again, we've been testing this in the, in the program that we've been developing. Um, and then this is a routine you might use, like let's say some words we'll hear during blending and it says, listen, discontinue. What's the word? Discontinue. Yes, discontinue. So companies discontinue unpopular products by syllable. Discontinue. And then you say it, discontinue. So we have students practice saying them before we start the lesson. And I think that that is sort of like a way to sort of thread the needle a little bit where we can teach students words that are less common, but still appropriate words for students to learn. Discontinue is not a, you know, an unfamiliar word. I think I actually looked it up when I was designing the slide and it wasn't super rare. And so I thought this could be a good word for students to learn and to teach, um, especially if you put it in some meaningful context in this sort of simple way like I did here. Um, and so we're going to want to do something like that to give kids familiarity because ultimately they're going to need this sort of flexible strategy. So let's flip over to morphemes now for a second. That's the second part of the chapter. Morphemes are written and spoken combinations that represents um, specific content concepts like re pronounce re uh, means again, and er pronounced er means someone who it can also mean uh, a comparative term like, you know, bigger, for example. The strategies recommended for this are to teach morphemes um, to, and to memorize affixes. So there are actually data showing that memorizing affixes is actually a good way to familiarize students with um, how these are pronounced. And so that can be really effective. There are a couple programs that have actually been tested and that have evidence of effectiveness that teach students to me memorize these, actually even without connecting them with meaning. My view would be that it's better to connect them with meaning um, because there are, are, are also data showing that morphology is really helpful for teaching kids, especially middle school students, high school students. Um, teaching those as meaning units turns out to be really, really important too. Um, and so, uh, so that's, I think, um, so that's important to do is to teach students these morphemes um, as affixes. And I'd recommend teaching them in a meaningful way, but it can actually help students even if you just teach them um, uh, just as units that we call orthographic units, just letter units, right? Um, and then we can do a strategy called peeling off. So after you've learned some of these high frequency affixes, focusing primarily on the pronunciation for uh, most common affixes um, for uh, for most of the affixes, focus on primary the pronunciation for them rather than on the meaning, we can do this peeling off strategy. We're identifying known affixes, cover them early on, and then stop doing this as soon as possible. Um, and so students don't have to do this. So we do the peeling off. We fun finally get down to the base word. We read that base word, and then we chunk the word with the affixes. So I'm going to use a favorite word of mine, which is... Let's see, why is it coming on the screen? Okay, favorite word is pseudo pseudo hyperparathyroidism, um, which is a really tricky word because it has <laughs> units we might not be familiar with, right? But it has meaning units in it, not all of which you teach students. So I'm doing this for you as adults. So pseudo is one we wouldn't teach kids, but that's, a, that's an affix. We can pull, we can peel that one off. Pseudo is another one. Hypo is another one. Para is another one. And ism is another one. So those are all affixes um, in the word. 
So we can actually take all of those and we can separate the word into those affixes. And then you get down to the base word thyroid. And when we cover all those up with thi to thyroid, then thyroid can be broken into two parts. And we use that chunking card, that syllable card, and we can say thy and then roid. We say thyroid, then we put the whole thing back together and we can read the whole word, pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism. Um, and, uh, and I'm not gonna tell you the definition, but you can look it up. Um, and so, uh, so that word is a good example of how you can use um, affixes to break long words into um, uh, bigger parts that reduce the, uh, the working memory drain for students, working memory uh, concern or associated with reading long words. If you do a word that has no meaningful parts in it, there's another one, there's some other really long words that are really hard to read because there are no meaning parts in them. The meaning parts really reduce the size of the problem. You also can teach morphological word families. So you can teach like the word nature actually is a really good one. It has a lot of words like nature, natural, um, supernatural, um, unnatural, unnaturally. These are all different words that you could teach as a group. And so teaching students a group of words and um, morphological families um, is really good. But in the list, so I teaching students just the more uh, familiar ones is good. And unless you're teaching a unit on, um, you know, ghosts or something, <laughs> supernatural is where we probably wouldn't teach kids because it's not that common. Right? Um, so here I kind of listed the ones that uh, I probably wouldn't teach from the, from the word na uh, nature and natural. Uh, you can also teach students um, morphological word families. So you can teach them all the words associated with react, words associated with sign, words associated with explore. And the sign one is a good one to think about because um, sign and signature, it doesn't sound exactly the same, but it has that same part in it. And so we can break that off. We can teach students to flex that, right? We can do kind of a flexible thing there. And consignee, and, uh, we probably wouldn't actually teach as a word because that's not as familiar with the other ones be an example, examples of base words that we might teach students uh, as a group and their data on that. The other thing that we've done in a program that I designed a number of years ago, and we had, um, we haven't done this more recently, and the data for this were um, pretty good. Um, it was a pilot study, and we had positive effects. Not all of them were significant. But what we did was we, we taught the students um, phrases. So rather than reading a lot of sentences or trying to find a lot of sentences that had, um, you know, really common, uh, you know, we had to kind of force words into sentences with all our affixes. We tried to find examples in uh, a database of phrases that were more common ones. So, you know, we have here, for example, instructor's manual, the greatness of restless night to be useless, uh, March Madness, which we should capitalize actually. Um, but those are all examples of phrases that we um, can teach students because they're pretty common. And so those are ones that we did to teach students to practice things like actor and useless. And so we found these phrases. The reason that this is helpful is that emphasizes the idea of getting in a lot of practice. Um, so, uh, so this is about, so I want to talk about, okay. How do I do it? So we are really almost out of time. Oh, we actually have two minutes. So, um, so that's, so I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm happy to stay longer um, if people would like me to, but um, but uh, but I know that we are we are at time almost. Um, so uh, there there aren't a lot of actually other questions um, so far. Um, Kelly asks, will you consider matrices when teaching word families? I'm not sure exactly what you mean, Kelly, but I know that in some programs they'll teach like like Asia has the uh sound at the end, like the A, and then teach like Asian has like the A-N that represents a person and so on. So sometimes people will do that. Sometimes it's called an ending grid. I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but those, those matrices are okay, but they end up teaching some pretty rare combinations. They're pretty cool. I think for meta knowledge for teachers, like I thought that ending grid was pretty amazing in terms of understanding how these are connected. Um, but I, if that's what you mean, then I wouldn't recommend it for kids because it gets into some pretty rare affixes. So, um, so that I guess is sort of um, the end of our time. I, I expected we would have plenty of time for me to talk about some other strategies. I guess I'll make a plug for a session I'm gonna do at the patent um, uh, conference in June. I'm actually gonna talk about 
uh, more advanced ways to think about the, the, uh, the reading rope and to get us beyond just the letters and sounds and think about how meaning is relevant for word recognition, because you know what, I think it is. Um, and, um, and so we'll, we can talk more about that. And Eileen is asking me to please stay, but I, I, so I'm happy to do that, but I want to defer to Lauren and uh, Pam and others if uh, you all would be okay with me saying, or um, if you want me to sort of wrap up here, I know that you've been keeping these to an hour, so you tell me. Thank you, Dr. Kearns. We're actually, to be respectful of people's time, we're gonna go ahead and do our closing comments sure. and make sure they have the code and everything. And then we'll be happy to continue for a few minutes past the eight o'clock okay. uh, hour. So we want to thank you for joining us for this evening's book study session, and thank you to Dr. Kearns for deepening our knowledge of Chapter 3, Structured Literacy Interventions for Reading Long Words. Um, just a reminder that we have been posting the recordings of the, these sessions in the series at our Patent Literacy Hub, and that can be um, found using that link that you used this evening to find the Padlet. So that's exactly where you'll be able to go back and find the recording to go back and listen uh, again, if you wish. Uh, we do want to make sure that those who are seeking Act 48, please click on the form link and the exit code for and use the exit code for the session that was put into the chat a bit ago. Maybe one of my colleagues can copy and paste that again. So we have that in there. Uh, the code for the session for this evening is H. H, B as in boy, M as in Mary. Um, and we ask that you please complete this by midnight to receive Act 48 credit. So if you could do that right now, it's probably in your best interest. Uh, we will look forward to having you join us once again on Wednesday, May 4th from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern for Chapter 4, which is Structured Literacy Interventions for Spelling with author Dr. Louisa Moat. So that should be a good one. And uh, please remember that you'll use that same Zoom link and passcode for every session in this series. The one last note we wanted to add in case you are interested, we'd like to invite you all to register for our 2022 Patent Virtual Literacy Symposium, which will be held this summer, June 14th through 16th. Our symposium will feature a number of expert researchers, presenters, and practitioners, including Dr. Kearns. Uh, Lauren will be sharing that link in the chat as well to the registration for our symposium if you are interested. Um, so I think we're going to hang on here with Dr. Kearns for a few more minutes, but please be sure to complete your Act 48 form with the code HHB as in boy, M as in Mary, to be able to get your Act 48. Thank you. Dr. Kearns, there were a couple of questions that I sent as well from folks. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Maybe if you uh, want to tell me the ones you'd like me to respond to, I can do that. Um, I know I saw, um, I sent you one from Julie Klingerman. Um, it was about the recent IES guide. And uh, there was another oh, question yeah. about whether uh, the, these, uh, for, you know, what you were advocating for syllable types, is that what you would um, also uh, suggest for students with dyslexia? So that's yeah. two I sent you. So. There may yeah. be others that went your way, but I know I sent those two to you. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I haven't read the um, four through nine practice guide, but what I'll say is that they asked me about this a couple of times. Um, and I sort of told them what, uh, what uh, you know, we talked about tonight. Um, and so I, to be honest, uh, Julie, I need to read that. Um, but I, I know Michael Kiefer and Sharon Vaughn who were on that practice guide. And I talked with both of them as they were working on this. So, um, so I think, that, um, you know, that sort of, um, uh, let's see, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, sort of, and then Julie kind of asked, like, my thoughts about teaching kids to be flexible, drawing from multiple strategies, with keeping things simple, avoiding cognitive overload. I think it's really, you know, that's where, I mean, we're going to have long words that are tricky for kids to know. That's why teaching affixes is good. That reduces the cognitive load. And if they memorize them, they basically will have them in their pocket as like, you know, units they can rely on. And I think that's the reason that I think that it actually does reduce the memory load to teach them this kind of flexibility. Um, and I think that even though flexibility brings in its own challenges, I think the flip side, the good thing is that it doesn't require them to remember this rule. 
Um, and then I, to the other question um, about, I think it was the one about um, the, the dyslexic students. Yeah, so that, so Stephanie, that's a great question because uh, you're right, a lot of programs do include that. And, um, and actually, you know, it's kind of a legacy of Orton Gillingham. Um, when I mean that, I mean like long ago when it actually started Orton Gillingham, right? And, um, you know, uh, they thought at that time, and there's actually a whole paper about this in um, the Annals of Dyslexia from back in the 50s. And it's a really cool article because a couple of the um, researchers, uh, kind of teacher educators who designed some of the aspects of um, or Gillingham, I think Anna Gillingham was one of the authors of this paper, you know, she, they quoted a student, an adult who was a, had dyslexia, who really found syllable division to be a powerful tool. Um, and I thought that that was really interesting. And I mean, the quote was sort of like, um, I, I, it didn't make it into this paper, another one that I did, but I wanted to put it in where it's sort of like, person's like, you need to know us. This is the most important thing ever. It really helped me learn to read. Now, and so I think that, you know, with, uh, you know, with Orton Gillingham, I think that for some older people, some adults who sort of have overall good sort of metacognitive skills in general, there is something kind of interesting for adults, right? And if you can understand that this is a pattern, but you can also understand that like there are a lot of instances in which it doesn't kind of, you know, work the way you intend, that can be a helpful thing for, for adults maybe to do, um, to kind of learn some of this meta knowledge. You know, I think there are a couple of programs that don't do much with civil division, but do teach the kids about the way your mouth is formed when you say words um, and so on. And I think some of those data, you know, like sort of telling kids that, you know, it's a puff of air when you say the p sound and it's kind of a stream of air when you say the s sound and so on. Those programs do have evidence. They're not evidence suggesting that that particular part of it is the most effective one, but those uh, components do seem to support students and uh, those programs seem to support students. It could be that part of it is the sort of understanding this linguistic aspect of it. And it's something kind of cool for students to know. And I know colleagues of mine have done a study of this program, found that kids, this was for fourth graders, really, this is kind of anecdotal, they really liked learning about the way that their mouths worked and things like that. And there are sort of cognitive reasons for that part in particular that that can be helpful. Um, but, um, but I think, you know, uh, uh, so, so I think that in those instances for adults and so on, there's, there's some potential rationale for teaching it actually. But for children who um, don't have that kind of meta knowledge, you know, sort of capacity to learn this complex meta knowledge and really the ability to kind of do that doesn't turn on until about like fourth grade. Um, and so as kids get older, you could argue that maybe for some of those kids with really severe difficulty, like maybe those kids could benefit. Um, but I think that um, in general for kids that we teach who have dyslexia, um, I think that there aren't a lot of data suggesting that that works. And there are lots of other programs that do work. And I think I have a, uh, an article coming out with some of my students in um, the Reading League Journal where we talk about this. How could you talk about, you know, let's, we got into it, we got into it. Should we do syllable division? And what I argue there, and I think is fair, is say, like, syllable division isn't a bad thing. It's not like the worst thing. I don't hate it or, you know, hate it. I don't think it's a bad idea. I think it gives kids some information. And people since the 50s have said that's its value is like it gives kids a place to start, right? And if you don't have a place to start, like getting something like civil division, even if it doesn't work all the time, is kind of helpful, right? It gives you confidence in a way. So, you know, that's part of the argument for it. And I get that. What I, my response to that is, what if we didn't do that? What if we did something else instead, right? What if we did something simpler? Could you tell me with certainty that th that doesn't work as well, right? And we did a really tiny little study on this where we actually did compared just how quickly kids could say syllables when we compared the rule versus just doing practice with syllables the way I described. And we found a little tiny effect favoring our strategy that kids, particularly the letters I and O, they got faster at teaching, at learning to read words like, you know, uh, minor and so on, when we taught them, not the rule, but we taught them the pattern, right? That I says I. And so, so I think that one was sort of like, um, you know, that's sort of a little bit of evidence for me that, you know what, there's something here 
where we don't actually have to do the rules and it can still be can still be effective. So, um, so um, let's see. Um, um, so Elise asked about when you're teaching affixes, do you teach those Latin based versus Greek based? Yeah, you know, the data on that aren't particularly strong. One of my doc students right now is doing a study on how kids use morphemes to process words and kind of in alignment with what I've already said, she found that middle schoolers don't really understand um, like meaningful affixes. High schoolers sometimes do and college students often do. Um, and she found that poor readers are less tuned into the, the kind of the acts, uh, you know, roots and the meanings of roots and how they might affect the word. She did not do anything with Greek and Latin roots. I think Greek and Latin root learning is a helpful thing for kind of domain things, right? If you're teaching like chemistry or, you know, geometry, it can be helpful to teach about potentially about, you know, these are words that come from Greek or whatever, but I don't think there are a lot of evidence. There's a lot of evidence suggesting like teaching that specifically is helpful, but again, it's sort of like interesting knowledge for kids who are kind of into it, right? That's not a bad thing. So, um, so Christine asks, how would you find how common a word was? Well, I was going to get to this. I have a website called Finder that I made that um, I was put in the chat. Um, uh, I, I'm embarrassed to say this actually, but I have a website, devinkearns.com. And if you go to this link, um, you can, um, I'm not sure I can actually put it in, um, but if you go to this link, devinkearns.com slash finder, P-H-I-N-D-E-R, uh, I can't put it in the chat then you can actually, um, you can go to that and you can see that. So um, so I think I should probably stop there. There's been a lot of other good questions, but I think it's probably a good place to, to stop. Definitely recommend you see uh, Dr. Lisa Motes next week. And I'm really excited to present at the patent conference or the symposium. And so uh, you can learn more about that there. And if you have questions in the meantime, you can email me. My email address is pretty easy to find online. So please do that. And I appreciate your time. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Dr. Kearns. Looking forward to seeing you, you in June. Yeah, I can't much. wait. So. <laughs> I'll be here before you know it. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I oh, um, so, someone asked about, about the site again. It's P-H-I-N-D-E-R, isn't it, Finder? Yeah, that's right. Um, I, for some reason, I couldn't type it in the, it says Laura, oh, so Laura, oh, let's see, everyone, yeah, okay. wait, hang on, hang on, let me do this. Okay, there it is. Okay, so there if you, you click go. on, oh, thanks, Jeannie. Jeannie did it. <laughs> Thank too. you, Jeannie. Um, so, yeah, so that's, so it's like, it's kind of a neat, like I think it's pretty kind of kind of neat. Um, so here's here's how it works. Um, I'll just show you a demo really quickly. So if you go to this, the way it's organized, you can. Um, it's it's designed to help you find like letter sounds. Like if you want to teach a lesson, you don't know which ones to teach or whatever. You can find these. So what you can do is if you want to search for pattern, there's some that are already here, but you can search ones that aren't here. Like if you want to search for um, let's say ER, which isn't on there. So you could click on ER and then it brings up the different um, pronunciations of ER. So it brings them up in IPA um, or quote sound code. Um, this one is the schwa version of the ER sound. This is the not schwa version. Um, that was a little bit tricky, but there are other sounds too, like ER occasionally says A, but not very often. But you click on that one and then in this three section, it populates it with ER says ER. And then if you click search for words, it brings up a list of words that all have the ER that says er in it, um, which is like, I think that was like, for me, I was like, this is super helpful. So um, the thing that it has over here that's kind of nice is it has a frequency list for you. So you can actually look at how frequent the words are. The frequencies come from a database called Unison, which is where these um, data came from. And I believe it's um, frequencies per million is the way that these are indexed. So this is how often these words occur per million words. But it's pretty convenient, you know, it kind of goes through and lists lots and lots of words. I get a lot of comments from teachers about um, things that they really like about it. There's also an options um, screen where you can pick the max number of syllables and letters, and you can pick your frequency range. So if you really don't want it to be like a super lot, you can sort of, you know, like I only want ones that are super low frequency, which you probably don't want, or super high frequency, probably somewhere, you know. And here, um, it will give you um, words that sort of only fit those criteria. So there aren't actually a hoop super loud of the words like that. So, and then you can filter words if you want to see if there's a word in there, if you want to see like, is, you know, her in there, and any word with her kind of comes up if it's already, it's not already been an option. So, so people will tell me that they like it a lot. I, I'm, 
I'm pretty proud of it. Um, I, I had a student work with me on it a long time ago, and um, I, I'm really happy to share it as a tool. And it's obviously totally free um, and no advertising, um, except that, you know, then you know my name. Um, but besides that, there's no advertising. And I really encourage you all to use it because I put a lot of time into it. Um, and I want to help you, you know, design lessons and look up frequencies if you want to. So that's a, that's a tool that you can use. So, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Kearns. Really appreciate it. We'll see you in June. And see you in we'll June. see everybody Thanks, else everyone. next week. <laughs> see you next yeah. Wednesday, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye, Dr. Kearns.